question is Rachel Gill from Wilson and Rice's Time Lecture. Thank you. So I'm going to tell you today about a project that we've been working on at Coral called um, Syntex, uh, specifically the Corpus Classroom Project. Um, I'm a project manager and a web developer at Coral. If you were just in the last talk, you heard about um, what Coral is, but I'll uh, come back to that in just a second. Unfortunately, my, the co-presenters could not be here today, but Dr. Turbio and Dr. Bullock are both at the University of Texas at Austin, and they basically conceived of this project. So, um, I also want to mention Carl White, who is still in the room. Um, he's also been very much involved in this project. He might chime in later. So, uh, if you weren't in the last session, we're Coral, we're the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at, at UT Austin. We're one of 15 national foreign language resource centers uh, funded by the Department of Education, but we are the only one that's focused on open education. So, I'm, are there foreign language teachers in the audience? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm not one, <laughs> but I've been hanging out with them for a few years now, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but um, one thing that I've learned is that, you know, when you're learning a language, you need a lot of input. Right? You need to hear the language, you need to read the language, you need a lot of stuff um, as input to, to help you understand. And so there's been this authentic materials movement um, in foreign languages because a lot of what you see in textbooks are these created texts as opposed to authentic texts that might be heard in the native speaker's environment, right? So an authentic text might be a newspaper article or a blog or a music video or these sorts of things. Um, and foreign language educators these, day, these days are increasingly um, seeing the need to bring those types of materials into the language classroom. Because this really is the language that students are gonna encounter in the world, right? Um, not the sort of made-up language that is present in a lot of textbooks. So, um, we can't really find authentic text in commercial textbooks. Um, but of course we have the open web and there's tons of great stuff out there. Most, a lot of openly licensed stuff that language teachers can use. YouTube is, you know, I think the foreign language teacher's best friend a lot of times. They're, it's a great place to go to find video content in many languages. Um, their captioning um, tool has gotten a lot better. They're doing automatic captioning, captioning for a lot of languages now, which is really cool. Um, and then you have a lot of openly licensed content that is available on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately for a foreign language teacher, it's gonna be very time consuming, right? To find something that, that would suit their needs, right? You can't search YouTube by, you know, commands or, you know, like, like I want to teach commands in Spanish. How are you going to find a video about that? How are you going to find a video about a particular theme that you're covering in your class? It's very difficult. And, you know, the content can always disappear, and, you know, unless you download it, even if it's openly licensed, teachers are always having to update their materials as these authentic materials get taken down. So another idea that's come along um, in recent years among uh, some foreign language educators is the idea of using linguistic corpora. Um, does anybody know what, is anybody familiar with what a corpus is? Yes. In linguistics? Okay. So a, a corpus basically is a large structured collection of language. You know, these are collections of written, maybe written texts, maybe oral texts that can have Usually, like the good ones have a, you know, over a million words, and they're really used for researchers, for, by researchers for understanding the language. And many people have said, well, these would be great for language learning, right? I mean, you have all this naturalistic language use, and you can, you know, the students can actually participate in kind of being researchers and discover this discovery learning, so, you know, they can discover for themselves what are the rules that govern the language, you know, by, by using these kinds of tools. Um, one example is the British National Corpus. That's a corpus of English text. And then um, from BYU, we have the Corpus de l'Espanol. Um, so this, this one, I think, has about a million words in it. And here's a screenshot. So, so um, benefits, obviously, you can search for you know, a part of speech in, in this type of interface. Um, so you can, and then 
view the examples of the language in context. So, you know, this, this makes sense for uh, language learning because um, it, it fits the model of, of what a language educator might be searching for. Unfortunately, this type of tool is really designed for a researcher. So, you know, the, the interface, just kind of getting up to speed on how to use a tool like this can be very overwhelming. And, of course, the content is, is generally not open, openly licensed. The, the yes. S, uh, Corpus for uh, Espanol is free and uh, right. it's there's free. no license to right. it. Right, it's, it's free, but I don't know in terms of the remixing and reusing. It is, you're right, it's an open website. Anybody can, can get access to it, right. So in our project, um, you know, we, we, so we see a lot of potential in these corpora. So, and we wanted to leverage the corpus and the, the, the types of linguistic data that are associated with the corpus, specifically for the development of OER for language learning. And we were lucky enough in the last year to get a grant um, to work on this. We were also lucky to have a corpus. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, the Spanish and Texas video corpus uh, started back in 2010 when, when we started with CORAL. And um, Dr. Toribio and Dr. Bullock who started the project are interested in sociolinguistics and specifically about language variation. And, um, they always, uh, you know, from the beginning, they wanted it to also have an educational use because they, they found there's a real need for um, almost, you know, validating the Spanish that's in Texas as real Spanish, right? And it's useful. It's useful for people studying Spanish in Texas to hear the Spanish that they're going to encounter um, from other speakers in Texas. So the way that we went about collecting the data, um, we trained undergraduate students at UT who were from bilingual communities, and then we sent them home with video cameras and asked them to interview their friends and family and acquaintances in Spanish. Uh, we used a set, if anybody's familiar with StoryCorps, that radio program where people interview each other, family members usually are people who have a relationship with each other. So that's what we used to kind of get the conversation started that we were videotaping. And I just want to show you just a really brief sample. It is in Spanish, but just to give you an idea of what the videos look like. ¿Cuál es la importancia del español para ti? El español que como nosotros vivimos hasta entre ¿cómo se dice? Una frontera, ¿verdad? Este ayuda mucho porque casi, o sea, La gente aquí habla mucho de español y la comunicación es algo que se necesita. Ya seas muy bien, o sea, para los... Okay, so you just kind of get a, a, the flavor of it. She's talking about the importance of Spanish to her. And, you know, she's from El Paso. She exhibits some regional variation in her speech and, you know, things, uh, things that you wouldn't see in a, if this were a, a video that was associated with a textbook normally. So our project, the Corpus to Classroom project, was um, essentially to take this research corpus, all this video content that was developed for research purposes, um, and turn it into uh, the spin text video archive, which is an OER. So in the research corpus, there's actually close to 100 videos right now. They're all about 45 minutes long, but they're all fully transcribed. They're synced, so they're captioned. Um, and they've also been tagged for linguistic features using automatic taggers. So we have all this, <coughs> this data on the one hand, but for the, the educational resource, we didn't want to have that whole huge data set, so we actually selected um, over 550 clips from 60 speakers. These are shorter clips because those are best for classroom use. Um, they, again, they're transcribed, they have the captions, um, and in addition to the, the uh, linguistic tagging, which is like part of speech and that sort of thing, we also develop these pedagogical tags that go into like grammar and pragmatics and that sort of thing, which I'll, I'll show you. <coughs> um, the video archive is completely open and we spent a lot of time working on a teacher-friendly interface. Now I'm just gonna show you, this is just one minute, it's an introduction to the website that we developed. 
the Spin Text Video Archive offers a new way for Spanish language teachers to find and use authentic videos. Quickly search through a collection of fully transcribed and captioned video clips organized by theme, grammar points, and vocabulary. Teachers can also highlight grammar and vocabulary from video transcripts, save and share video playlists, and access other resources like lesson plans. All videos and materials are licensed using Creative Commons licenses, which means teachers can legally reuse and remix the content to create customized learning materials. Created by CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, and funded by the Department of Education and the University of Texas at Austin, the Spintex Video Archive is a high quality, free, and open resource for teachers and learners. Start browsing the site to learn how you can begin using Spintex in your classroom today.
still working on it, though. We have we don't have every grammar point. You know, we had a year to pull, pull this together, and so um, it involved writing a lot of rules for these different grammar points on you know how to how to search and identify them. So we don't, by any means, have every grammar point covered. It's just we we started with a set of textbooks and worked through and tried to find the most frequent ones to start with, and so that's what you'll see. We also have, for the teachers who requested some lesson ideas, we do have some, some um, these are just not meant to be full, full lesson plans. They're, uh, one of the things we noticed when we were working with teachers is that the formats of lesson plans, and you know, especially when you're talking about secondary level versus college level, they're so different and various. So we just wanted a really simple, like here's an activity you can do, it takes 10 minutes to prepare, It'll take 15 minutes of class time. There's an easy way to start using the videos. And then if you go to our blog, you can see um, more ideas like that and actually some, some full lesson plans. Okay, so let me just go back. All right, so throughout the process, as I've mentioned, we've had, we had a lot of um, workshops with educators starting from you know before we had this website and then when we when we launched the website in May we've continued to um, work on it with with educators to, to try and see how to best integrate it into their particular classrooms and so this is an example of one way it's being used at UT um, there's a new Spanish for heritage learners curriculum that's being developed there and the videos our video tool is being used for lab activities for the students uh, we've also been uh, collaborating with the World Languages Coordinator at the Austin Independent School District, and she's developed some lesson plans using our videos, and they're very, you know, very specific to, to the context that she's working in. And one other thing that we learned about that we didn't know when we, we started the project is the AP Spanish Language and Culture exam has actually changed. A new version just came out. Um, this fall, and it's really interesting because the themes, you know, there's themes, families and communities, personal and public identities, they they really fit so well with the content that we have in this in this video archive. So that's definitely a future direction we're going to be working to see how we can align our videos with uh, this framework. Throughout the process, we've uh, tried to be as open as possible. We do have a blog um, from Corpus classroom blog where we shared uh, everything we did on the site from I mean, to, for the development of the site uh, as well as ongoing so it was um, previously focused on sort of a lot of technical stuff technically how we, we did all this but now it's starting to be focused around how educators are using this so we'll be posting we'll continue to post as um, we, we work on the site Again, um, as we were doing this project, of course, it was really important for us to get the consent of all the participants. We did go through IRB for this, for the research component, and then, of course, we had to have the appropriate release forms that, so that every participant knew this was going to be published, it was going to be open. Um, so that's, you know, we're, and we're happy to share those, those forms with anybody who's interested in, in replicating something like this. We also used all open source software and open APIs. Um, as I mentioned, this YouTube captioning is really cool because they have an API where you can send up a transcript to the video and it'll send you back a caption file, which we used because it was free and we could send it up multiple times as the, as the transcripts were edited. And of course we developed our own custom code and then the interface is built in Drupal and the Apache Solar does the, the search engine. Can I just ask you this point? So you, yeah, they are actually living inside YouTube, and then they're referenced in. No, no, we actually we, no. They okay. we we didn't actually decide to host them in YouTube. Okay. We're hosting them on our own media server. But we process them through YouTube. It's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm like. Yeah. Uh huh. So yeah. and then you put them in that, and then you brought them back out again. <laughs> that's really but well, they were so they we we did the full interviews in, but that's those. So it's not exactly the same because we, we sent the full length videos through YouTube. Yes, okay. 
Um, and then we had a process where we chopped up the videos and chopped up the transcripts. Uh, we're sharing all of our code. Um, not all of it's really pretty <laughs> at this point, but you know anybody's welcome to take it and um, build on to it. And as well, we're we're sharing the the data that was used just for the clips that are in the, the archive as well as um, all of the tags that are associated with it. So the annotated data is also available. So in the future, we want to continue working with educators and um, look at how we can integrate it into different types of classrooms. Um, we hope that it's something really versatile and so far it seems to be. And you know, I think we want to explore these emerging standards. You know, there's not a common core for foreign language right now, but uh, there are these frameworks such as the you know p21.org. Uh, there, there's a world languages um, framework there, and I think more and more these are going to be very helpful in in for teachers for us to design OER and then for teachers to understand how to integrate those OER into their curricula. And our dream would be to really refine this process that we've developed for tagging and apply it to all the other great open video content that's out there. There's a lot of other collections that we wouldn't have to build ourselves. And if we could take our tools and use some of that other open license content, um, that would be just such a great resource. Um, but it would, it's going to take some more work to, to, because every time you tag a new collection, you have to sort of train your, your processes to that collection. But that's ultimately where we'd like to go, is to, is to really make this a more generalized tool and to continue to, to uh, develop more language learning resources. And so that's it. Here's, if you're interested in learning more, um, you can just that spintext.org and get to our blog and everything else. Are there any questions? Are, is this presentation going to be on uh, share whatever? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's a place that everybody's putting. We, we normally put ours up on SlideShare. It's a SlideShare. Yeah, SlideShare. I'd love to see this, of course, in every variety of every language. But is there are there any other projects similar to this that you're aware of in other languages going on, or not specific, not really like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and actually, this corpus is really unusual too. Mm -hmm. Just like in the research world, to have an oral corpus that's mm -hmm. really pretty large, like it's a, mm -hmm. you know U.S. Spanish. It's, yeah. it's kind of a so yeah, the regional variant is really neat. Right, yeah. yeah, and that's another thing I know the researchers would like to expand it to Spanish in the U.S. Yes. eventually, and so they're trying to get other researchers on board. So there's this whole other research side of this yeah. project and the open data mm -hmm. side to that project. It seems to have a great deal of um, overlap with the oral history researchers, mm -hmm. yes. and I know that some people have done attempted to do some collections mm -hmm. that have an oral history kind of event to it. It seems to have a similar method. So my question, just in a pragmatic sense, mm -hmm. is um, I'm really impressed with this project. It, it, it's amazing. But the front end of it, where you actually trained that strategy of using the bilingual communities and training some people to go there and do those interviews. Mm -hmm. So so that was like a, a you trained a student to be like a video, just to get the, with a video camera and make sure the frame was right and they had some decent lighting. So it wasn't the bilingual. It was another person on top of the interviewer, or was no, it the it was one, was the one, one person. person? Yeah, we started out trying to encourage them to work in pairs because we thought that would be so much easier to have one person focus on the technical and one. Yes. But they all chose to, to do, do it on it. their own, and, and, and I think it's just logistics mostly. But it's interesting because my, my work is to develop uh, open academic content in a video, in video on YouTube. So. I've been finding just the one, uh, I've been working with one student intern and one casual, and what we, we end up with the same method, it's one camera, one light, mm -hmm. um, and have basically trained them in simple video production, and we find, found them incredibly productive throughout, so to see that that's just kind of echoed in the way that you've got more strategy with who you're targeting, but mm -hmm. it's... Um, a similar practical experience about how viable it is actually to get the actual video product out. 
and then I, I've been to my professional video production crew and they won't do with it because yeah. it's not a two camera shoot. And if it's not a two camera shoot, it doesn't count. Yeah. But it's so fascinating because the guy who does a two camera shoot cannot think of the content and edit it quickly yeah. later. He has to have a full log and a time code. So This is ethnographic. Out. It's really a very different kind of beast. And the person that I've got, my student who attends the academic stuff, is able to edit it an hour and a half because they're actually listening to the content and not really worrying too much. Yeah. Quite fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your presentation. Okay. Thank you.